Our life is a string of stories. They are the experiences we have lived and that have shaped us into who we are. Some we like to forget because they are painful and they are powerful. But when we share them with others, they give us strength, they give us purpose, they tell us where we have come from and why we are on this planet. At the 2019 Conexiones Summit, and to honor the theme, connecting our stories for a common purpose, seven Latinos and Latinx chose to share their stories from their own diverse lived experiences. They are stories of power, strength, change, resiliency, joy, hope, family, and life journeys. We are happy to share them with you so that we may create connections because it's in the storytelling that we share our humanity and that shared humanity help us create a better world for all of us. So we thought that if we called the, the summit connecting our stories for a common purpose, we thought that wouldn't it be great to have a group of Latinx folks to tell their stories? Because after all, that's, that's what makes our lives uh, stories. And so it is really our pleasure, uh, and it took some work uh, to find seven people, seven Latinx folks from throughout the state, uh, and work with them to craft their stories. So we have seven of them, uh, and on your tables, uh, you should see the programs. Uh, you, you can find a little bit more about their bios, the work that they do, the places where they're coming from, or the places that they call home. Uh, some of them have traveled afar, and actually I know one of them has to leave tonight to go back home, and it's, a, it's many hours of drive to get back. Now, each, each storyteller uh, will perform a piece, probably eight, nine minutes, and um, they've been working on this actually for several months now with a coach so that they can craft a good story or uh, share with you part of their life experiences. These stories are powerful, they are emotional, they are honest, and these are their personal stories as well. And, and we at the Oregon Community Foundation are really grateful that they accepted and willing to share their stories with us and for the time that they've put in crafting these stories. So sit comfortably. Uh, we will have five minute intermission after the fourth story, so if you need to get up. But in between the stories, if you really need to get up, that's also okay. Uh, but we wanna give them our, our full attention. And at the end of the, the storytelling, uh, make sure to stay with us or stick around if you can uh, for a special music guest, uh, Savila will also join us at the end uh, of, the, of the storytelling. So with that, uh, to begin our event, um, and I'm, I'm looking at her from here, we have our first storyteller, Saira Sanchez, who is a community organizer and director. Yes, an applause, yeah. Saira is a community organizer and director of external communications at the grassroots organization Raices. Saira has traveled all the way from Hermiston uh, to be here with us tonight, and she's the one that also has to go back home tonight. So please join me in welcoming our first storyteller, Saira. Hi, everybody. 
How many of you struggle with asking for help? For me, asking for help is really hard. I grew up an extremely shy and nervous person. I wanted so badly to blend in and appear normal. I would get really nervous and I thought that that was something that was inconvenient to others. So I tried everything I could to just kind of go unseen and unheard. Um, my, my unusual behavior, you know, would sometimes get to the point where like I couldn't even eat. That's how nervous I would get sometimes. And so, of course, there, there came a rule in second grade where you could, you had to eat a certain amount of food in order to leave the cafeteria and go to recess. And I thought right away, I, I felt myself getting nervous and like my, my stomach clenched up, right? And I was like, eight-year-old me, oh no, like I'm not gonna be able to leave. Um, so I came up with a plan, right? I decided that I was gonna accidentally drop my food underneath the table so that I could then leave and go to a recess, right? Eventually the custodian caught on and um, reported it to my teacher who then one day pulled me aside and said, what's going on? Why aren't you eating? And I, you know, was confronted, right? I had no idea really why I was doing this, right? One of my unusual behaviors. Um, and like I said, I always wanted to go unseen and unheard and now I'm being confronted. So I said, I don't know, um, the other kids gross me out. And she said, okay, well, it's really important for you to eat, so um, we're gonna have to maybe put you in the office, like in the nurse's office so that you can eat there. I said, okay, and I was eating. This didn't solve my problem, right? I, I was still nervous, I was now isolated during lunch, um, and that was my coping strategy. As I got older, somehow it became, from being nervous and worried a lot as a little kid, it turned into being stressed out and overwhelmed. That's what people were labeling it as. And now people were saying, oh, you should stop worrying, stop worrying so much, you know, just relax. Maybe you should start working out so that you can release that nervous energy that you have, um, you know, and, and that'll help. And so I listened. In middle school, I started running track. And I ran so much that I actually got to go to college. I, I ran in college. So fast forward to college, and um, my, my last term of my undergrad. And I have my routine. I have my coping strategies, right, working out. And I one day I'm on the track doing a repeat 150 workout, typical, simple workout. But now I'm hyperventilating. And this is a very common workout, right? But I can't do it anymore. So I take some time off. Now I'm in the classroom. I'm working on my final paper. I'm like pages away, just a few pages away from finishing it. And this is the last assignment before I graduate, basically. And I can't, I, like, I keep getting nervous, like feeling woozy when I'm sitting in front of the computer. And so I go to my advisor and I say, you know, I don't, I don't know what to do. Like, I, I feel so stressed out about this, and I, don't, I can't not graduate. And so um, she told me, um, you know, I want you to know that if you were to submit this paper like this today, you, you'll graduate. Like, you already have enough. So don't beat yourself up about this. Your well-being is important. And she encouraged me to just kind of back off of it, you know. So I took her advice. And I ended up taking two weeks off from school. And this is, you know, like a month, a couple months before graduating. And I went to Mexico to kind of check out from reality. But of course, I had to return. And on that flight back, I experienced my first ever full-blown panic attack. So I'm sitting on the plane, getting ready to fly back to Portland. 
and I start getting really cold hand, like cold hands, clammy, sweaty hands. My breathing starts getting shallow. I start getting shaky. And even the person next to me says, are you okay? You look really pale and like sickly. And this is one of my fears, right? Standing out and being weird. Um, so now I'm like, oh no, like it's noticeable. Something's wrong with me. So I get up and I go to the lavatory and I look at myself in the mirror, splash some water on my face, snap out of it, you know, like, you're, you're fine, but I'm not. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror and my vision's getting blurry and I feel like I'm gonna pass out. So I go, all I could do is I go back to my seat and I'm thinking like, wow, I'm hundreds of miles up in the sky right now, trapped in this metal can with no escape, right? I can't run away from this. Um, this is how I'm going to die. That's how bad I felt. I really thought I was going to die. I thought that I was gonna stop breathing from how weird I was feeling, and that was gonna be the end of me, and I would never graduate. So I was contemplating, what do I do, what do I do? I'm panicking, right? I'm spiraling out. And all I can think was, I'm gonna reach up and press this button and ask for help because something is wrong with me. And if I don't ask for help, I'm going to die on this plane right now. So I pressed the button. I was able to graduate. I got back to Portland. I graduated. And I thought that the feelings would go away, right? The overwhelming feelings, the stress would go away once I, once I didn't have school anymore. I didn't have to run on the team anymore. You know, I, I didn't have responsibilities. Um, but the feelings didn't go away, they stayed. And I still felt nervous, I still felt worried, I still felt stressed, overwhelmed, scared, tired, heavy, and there was no explanation. And so I, I got to that point again where I found myself saying, I need help, something is wrong with me. So I called my mom, mommy, ayúdame. Me siento muy mal. Pienso que me voy a morir. So my mom came to Portland the next day and she took me to the doctor. This is where I was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. There's a, there's a word for what I was feeling my whole life. And at first it was really overwhelming to accept that. I felt like something was really wrong with me, right? But once I got put on medication, it helped stabilize my chemical imbalance, and I started going to therapy. And it was when I started going to therapy where I really started understanding what it meant to deal with anxiety, and I started learning coping strategies and different techniques so that I could live with this discomfort instead of being afraid of it. And so it's those coping strategies that have given me the ability to stand up here and do something like this. I never would have expected me to do something like this. But it's thanks to that practice, right, and learning to, to deal with that short-term discomfort that I'm able to be up here and use my voice, the voice that I was so afraid to use um, to be seen and heard when I, all I wanted to do was hide. So, I found the courage, right, through the hard work. I found the courage to use my voice and be seen because it matters. Thank you. Our next storyteller is Eduardo Rodriguez. Eduardo spends his days at Weddell Elementary School here in Salem, or in Kaiser, sorry, and where he not only teaches fifth grade, but he also runs the Weddell Jiu Jitsu Club after school program for students. And Eduardo, thank you for sharing your story with us. So, an applause. Thank you.
All I remember is sitting down on a bench looking at my shoes and hearing the words, do you want to say anything from the judge's mouth. I pick myself up off the bench and I walk toward the aisle. I hit the magnetic doors and I turn right and everything I was about to say goes blank. I look to my left, I see an orange jumpsuit, some handcuffs, and eyes staring back at me. The man who murdered my uncle is about to get sentenced. And I had something to say, but it disappeared. I remember going to speak and then choking up. And tears running down my face and looking at the family behind him, crying and weeping and looking at my family, crying and weeping and thinking, I wish this would have happened differently. I wish at 18, I wouldn't be in a court hearing And I told him exactly that. And then I said I forgave him. And as I turned around and walked past, I thought, he's 23. This is five years away. Where am I gonna be at 23? At that moment, I was a freshman in college, dealing with dorm things. I wasn't supposed to be in a courtroom, processing trauma, PTSD, my feelings about you know, capital punishment, all these things. I was just supposed to be having fun, taking my classes. And the year before, I was just supposed to be a 17-year-old, applying for college, trying out for soccer teams. Instead, I was attending Rosarios. I was trying to find a way to apply to college. I didn't want to go until my grandmother gave me an out. She said, in four years when you get your diploma, we'll start a restaurant like you want to. We can honor your uncle that way. And I said, okay, grandma, I'll do it. I signed up and boom. A year later, I'm walking in that courtroom thinking, I don't know what I'm doing here. As I go to sit down on the bench, I look to my left and my grandmother isn't there. She's died two months prior. And I'm just thinking, what am I doing here? Fast forward five years, I'm 23. I'm sitting down looking at my shoes again my faculty advisor is telling me I'm about to fail out of college. And I tell him, no, I can't, I can't, that's not gonna happen. And he says, why are you here? And I say, oh, my mom wanted me to go to school. It was my family's dream. He says, no, 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 why are you here? I say, I'm the first in my family to get a high school diploma as a male. My father has a fifth grade education. My uncle didn't graduate. This was the conversation with you, Oswaldo. And uh, I said, I don't know why I'm here. He said, you need to figure it out because you're about to withdraw. And so I went home and I thought about it and I took an academic recovery course, I guess you'd say, and somehow everything came back together. Um, I went to counseling, I started dealing with my emotions. In three months, I was on honor roll. In two years, I was graduating as the first member of my family to graduate university. And when I was taking my last bit of classes, I had to volunteer at an elementary school. And I thought, I could do this for a while. 
And so I got a job out of high school, I mean out of college, not high school anymore. <laughs> I got a job out of college as a teaching assistant, we call instructional assistants now. And I'm walking down the hall and one of my teachers comes up and she says, I can't get this student to do anything. He's just moping around all day. I don't know what, I don't know what's up. Will you talk to him? And I said, okay, I'll go talk to him. And um, he sits down and I say, okay, let's, let's work on this. He's like, I don't want to work on this, Mr. Rodriguez. He says, I, I'm just sad. And I go, okay, why, why are you sad? I was thinking they didn't serve his lunch that day. Maybe he wanted pizza and he had to eat a hot dog. Maybe this is going to be that. Um, and he goes, I miss my dad. And I said, what, what's your dad doing? And he says, oh, mom says he went on a trip. And I said, well, you can just, uh, you just miss him until he comes back. You just think about happy times. You, maybe you write him a letter, you send him a phone call. Um, and you just think about the good times until he comes back. And then he said something. I remember he said, oh, well, my mom says it's going to be a while. What he didn't know is that his father had sent us into lockdown two weeks before because he assaulted someone and he had just gotten a life sentence. Charge, not sentence. And when I'm having this conversation with him, I'm just trying to make him laugh. And he does eventually, he perks up. And I say, anytime you need to talk, just come see me. And I walked him back to class and he took his seat. And my brain just went back to that courtroom. Went back to that moment I was standing at the podium and I looked over to that family and I saw a little boy. Thank you. Our next uh, storyteller is uh, Jaime Arredondo. I think many of you know Jaime. Jaime lives in Salem but he is also the executive director of Capaz's Leadership Institute and he's worked in a nonprofit sector for at least 14 years now. I think he started at the Farm Worker Housing Development Corporation. So it's our pleasure uh, to have Jaime share his story with us. Jaime. If you can please join me for the Farm Worker Clap That was used by Caesar and Dolores during the beginnings of the farm worker movement and the UFW. I'd like to dedicate this story to my fellow immigrants in the crowd and my fellow immigrants outside these walls. And in particular, a couple of immigrants in the crowd, two of the main organizers of this event, Roberto Franco and Mirna Lorelli. The Nayarit and the Guatemala. It's been a long journey, a long journey. My journey began in a place called La Ranas Michoacan, the state of the monarch butterflies, las mariposas monarcas that are making their journey down to Michoacan as we speak right now. La Ranas at the time was a very underdeveloped little village with no electricity, no running water, and the motor transportation was mainly by walking. And I still remember La Ranas very vividly, very vividly. I remember walking to La Escuela, to the school, and there was a panaderia nearby, a pastry, and I could smell the bread, you know, that great bread, and I couldn't taste it because I couldn't afford it. And I would pass by every day with my brother Ephraim and smell that bread like it was in my nose and I couldn't taste it. 
I remember el carnaval, la fiesta del año, the big carnival, and walking in there and smelling all the foods, los chilaquines, el pozole, los buñuelos. You know, Mexican food is really good, right? And not being able to taste it. I remember being hungry, being hungry. I remember walking behind my grandfather, mi abuelo, as he plowed to the land, and I followed him planting the corn seeds, planting the corn seeds, because that was our survival. I thought La Ranas was it for me. I thought that was my world as I walked around. But they would have otherwise. My father was up here in the Northwest working in the fields, desde California hasta Washington. And he saw something over here. He saw kids in school buses. He saw families together. He saw trabajo, money grows on trees, he said. En los árboles. And he had this vision that he wanted that for us. And in 1986, something happened that made that more real. And that was the Immigration Reform Control Act. And my dad said, this is it. And he went to a place to get his papeles, a place by the address of 356 Young Street in Woodburn, Oregon, Pecun. And he got his papers within like two weeks, the volada, right away, he got his papeles. And so he said, okay, it's time for you guys to come up with me. It's time to come and unite the family. And so he brought us up, this the Michoacan, and we landed in Salem, Oregon. I rode up on the canopy of his Chevrolet truck that he had purchased. And when we landed in Salem, Oregon, I remember the first day of school when I lined up and there was all this food the hash browns, the fruta, el jugo, la leche, cereal. And I'm seeing kids line up, grabbing their food. So I do the same. And I see that they're not charging me. Free food. Orale, free food. This is going to be good. And I lived in a little apartment con mis hermanos y mi hermana on State Street in Salem, Oregon. One bedroom. It like felt like a mansion. And I remember La Segunda, Goodwill, right? We get clothes cheap, all the clothes we could get, right? Barata. I remember the summer times we go berry picking, right? And I was like, Papa, you're right. There's money in the trees. The more I pick, the more I make, right? This is great. I remember getting Christmas presents, de la Salvation Army. All these presents I would stay up and watch the presents. I was like, I can't wait till I open them. And then I realized that not all the kids were like me. That not all the kids shopped in La Segunda. Not all, that not all the kids got their food from the food pantry. And I started to get angry because I couldn't push those blueberries during the winter time because they were too expensive. They were too expensive, I could not purchase them. I started getting angry because I see my dad drinking in the job, right, because he had to deal with his back pain. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go to school. Porque no quiero ser campesino. I don't want to be a farm worker, right? And I want to speak better English también. So I took French in high school so I could speak better English. <laughs> that didn't work out very well. <laughs> I never used French after that, actually. <laughs> but I thought I know how, though. I was very angry. And I said, I'm going to be a teacher right after I graduated from, from, from Willamette University, which where I went. Puros <laughs> hueros. And uh, fate had it that I was to return back to the farmer community. So in, right 15 days after graduating from Willamette, I got a job at the Farm Worker Housing Development Corporation. It's in the house, by the way. And interestingly, that same summer, I ended up back in the same apartment that I landed on 13 years back to try to bring a family into the house in sight on State Street, right? And a few years later, after seven years in, in FHDC, 
I found myself back in a similar place, now a pecun, running pecun, and I was able to lead a massive transition of leadership that resulted now in the sons and daughters of immigrants and farm workers leading the organization. And today I find myself in the same place where my father started the journey. 356 Young Street, Woodburn, Oregon, now called the Capaces Leadership Institute. That's working, that's working to strengthen the wellness, capacity, and political consciousness of leaders like you, organizations like yours, movements, and ultimately the comunidad to eliminate social disparities. And I travel that journey every day to go to Capaces, right? And I think about the last 30 years. I think about my dad's vision. I think about the struggle to adapt to this community. And I think a lot about the future, our future. And you know what I see? I see us leading everywhere in education, in healthcare, in arte, cultura and el gobierno, and philanthropy, one day we'll have the Latino Community Foundation. I see us everywhere. And I think about my daughters, mis dos hijas, three years and 11 months. And I think about that little boy who crossed the border, who was hungry, and I wish I could tell him, it's gonna be okay. Don't be afraid. Because we believe in tomorrow. That's who we are. We believe in tomorrow. Gracias. Next to the microphone is uh, Gresham City Councilor, Eddie Morales, who uh, made the journey to civic leadership after nearly, nearly two decades in grassroots community organizing and experience as a small business owner. Uh, welcome to the stage, Eddie. Gracias, Roberto, y gracias, Mirna, por haberme invitado. Um, this topic of story is really important to me and has become very relevant. Uh, when I chose to run for public office, I knew that all of the things that, uh, and the situations that I had grown up, grown into, were going to once be held against me. And our local paper and some of our conservatives tried to do that recently by telling my story uh, without permission. I tell my story, but I tell my story in rooms like this, uh, when it is meant to inspire people, when it is meant to connect. Um, and so today I'm about to tell you my story, um, and it is given to you, not taken the way that some people will try to do that. Oregon has meant refuge, many first, love, friendship, family, beauty, beginnings, hope. But it also has meant racism, xenophobia, gangs, addiction, poverty, murder, and pain. Oregon has brought me so much joy and so much suffering over my life. It is impossible for me to ignore it or forget it. Today I have the opportunity to live anywhere I want in the world, but I remain committed to Oregon and to the people who live here. My relationship with Oregon began in the first grade. My mother moved my siblings and me to Oregon to escape my abusive father and to keep my brothers away from joining local gangs in East LA. She had $200 in her purse, spoke no English, and told my brother to get in the car and drive north without stopping. We landed in Woodburn, and for the first time, we began to experience poverty 
and isolation. We didn't know anyone when we came to Oregon. My mother raised my brothers and me with the help of my elder siblings. And as we got to know our community, she started preparing meals for local farm workers and taking care of their kids while they worked. Some of our neighbors were addicts and she cared for them too. My mother and siblings always struggled to make ends meet. So we had to move a lot in search of housing and work. This led me to live in Sherwood, Milwaukee, Portland, and even a farm in Ridgefield, Washington. Moving took its toll on my family, and we weren't always welcomed where we lived. People called us beaners, wetbacks, and told us to leave. At the age of 16, a white man shot my brother in the head and killed him. That same year, I dropped out of high school. Later, I went back to make my family proud to be the first to graduate high school. I worked three jobs through that time, and I attended night school to catch up. The support that the community gave me and the work that I put in paid off. And in 1999, I brought tears to my mother and family's eyes by becoming the first in my family to go to college. It was at the University of Oregon where I met my partner, Hugh, and fell in love and came out. It was there where I also learned about systemic issues that affected my community, and I committed my life to organizing. With these lessons in mind, I took on campaigns to boycott pig sweet mushrooms in solidarity with farm workers. I ended the affiliation of the University of Oregon Sports Station with hateful pundits like Michael Savage and Michael Medvin. And I helped to lead to get Eugene a fair housing code. To leverage this institutional support I needed to win these campaigns, I got involved with campus politics. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, <laughs> I'm like you, I was studying Chinese and Spanish <laughs> and planning public policy. I was eager, I didn't know what I wanted, but I was eager. But I knew that I wanted to achieve social change. Once I had a better understanding of the circumstances that had plagued poor people, people of color, students, and the LGBTQIA folks, my family, my friends, and me, I committed to ending them. Although I shown that I had the ability to organize when I began to explore work in Oregon, Someone once told me, after they laughed, that I would be a good field organizer one day. That cut me deep. After all the work that my friends and I had done, I was still not good enough, and it wasn't my turn. I didn't take it to heart, though, and I didn't wait around for my turn. I refused to know my place because I had other plans. That end of my University of Oregon I was elected president of the United States Student Association. Once elected, I moved to Washington, D.C., and I served as the voice of students in Congress, in the White House, and the Department of Education. In D.C., I was exposed to leaders from diverse backgrounds, leading major social change in the world, who validated, nurtured, and uplifted my leadership. I went on to work by an organization that Bobby Kennedy started to end poverty, and then worked with Rosario Dawson and Ivo Langoya to engage the Latino community in politics. This then led me to work as an advisor to the country's wealthiest donors, and then I started my own business in public relations to elevate the people that were like me trying to make change. Now in 2014, I lost my mother and decided that I was gonna come home to Oregon to take care of my family. When I got back here in January of 2016, I started to get involved in as many things as I could. But the 2016 election, I realized that getting involved part-time or volunteering wasn't enough. I started an organization called East County Rising to address the inequalities in Monoma County, which, many people don't know this, that if you split Monoma County down 82nd and each part of the county were its own state, 
the second part of the left side of the state, the west side, which is Portland, would be the second wealthiest state in the country. Meanwhile, the east side would be the second poorest. At that same time, I decided to run for office to try to inspire other people outside of the usual profile of politicians to enter public service and to, and to govern with their lived experience. We had a tough race, but I unseated an incumbent with a 59 vote, 59 vote victory. Since then, I became the first Latino, the youngest, and the first openly LGBT elected in the city of Russia. I went on to help other people run. I've asked 22 people to run for office and worked on their campaigns, and 20 of them won their elections. <clears throat> Today, I'm a philanthropic and political donor, a community organizer, a volunteer, a board member to many organizations, and a Gresham City Councilor. Oregon and its people came through for me, and now I intend to come through for them. I know that a lot of us in this room have experienced Oregon in many ways, some happier, some harder, and some similar to me. I know we'll all be successful and have many opportunities, but I know that our work will never give up to make Oregon live up to its motto, Alice Volat Propris. With your help, we will make this great state a place where we all, regardless of what we look like, who we love, where we come from, or what we do for a living, so that we may all fly with our own wings. Thank you. The next uh, storytelling segment is with Erika Ledesma. Erika, yes, yeah. Erika is an artist, a youth mentor, a community organizer, and also a co-founder of the storytelling project Noche de Cuentos in Medford. Earlier today, also, uh, Erika also led a session about storytelling and she's come all the way from Medford to sh share her story with us. Erica. Buenas tardes. Good evening. I just want to honor the indigenous people of this land because it is Indigenous Peoples Day. So I'm 20 years old, living in Mexico City as an international student. I was in Chapultepec, and I was walking around, and then I see the Museum of Modern Art. And it was about to start raining, so I'm like, oh, all right, perfect. I'm going to go check out the art museum. So if you've ever been there, you walk in, and there's, it's all marble floors. There's a flight of stairs to the right and to the left. And so I went up the right stairs. And I was walking around in this art museum. There's these paintings by the famous, you know, Diego Rivera, Siqueiros, Remedios Barro. And I just kept walking around. And then I took a right, and then I saw the painting. Las dos Fridas, the two Fridas. And if any of you have seen this um, painting before social media, you know, exploited Frida Kahlo, it's actually pretty huge. And in this painting, it's a self-portrait of Frida holding hands. Um, and it's two versions of her that represents this dual heritage. You know, one of them, she's dressed in a Western European dress, and in the other, she's dressed in a traditional Mexican Tepahuana dress. And then in the outside, it's the exterior with her heart bleeding. And for me, that painting represented like my journey to find that internal war within me for my identity growing up. I grew up in Talent, Oregon, rural Oregon, in this blue apartment complex across the gas station. And this is where my conscience began. I remember everyone in that apartment complex looked like me, spoke Spanish, it was a migrant community. Um, you know, the gas station, 
every Friday, six o'clock, would have fresh donuts, and we would all run there. You know, everyone would be like, all right, who's gonna get them this time? Um, you know, there was the two elders in the community that would take care of the children when the dads were away as pineros, working in the farms when the mothers were also working. So then I got to know everyone in that apartment complex. We all shared birthday parties together. You know, we really got to know each other. And Spanish was my native language. As soon as I started school, I was placed in a ELL um, program and I started learning English. You know, and I remember I was in third grade and I was struggling because I was kind of slow at learning English. And my friend, I was asking, I was like, hey, like, me puedes ayudar? And she started helping me. And then she started explaining to me in Spanish and I remember the teacher just ran up to her. She's like, you, you guys be quiet, don't speak Spanish. And we're just kind of like froze. And then we went to the bathroom and we just kind of like started laughing and we just started speaking Spanish again. <laughs> you know, but there was constant attacks that on my culture language that started diminishing my sense of self. I remember in middle school that I would try so hard to be fluent and to not have an accent because I was afraid that they would think that I was slower or that I didn't understand or I wasn't smart enough. And I remember they, we'd have to learn how to read like the first paragraph of the Constitution, you know, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, you know, in front of the teacher. And I remember the teachers like, wow, like you speak really good English for you. Um, where are you from? You know, I'm like, oh, I'm from Ashland. You know, I was born there. And they're like, no, but where are you really from? You know, that's always a second question that they ask you. Um, and for me, Growing up, I remember going home with this questionnaire about who we are and filling in the bubbles. Like I would be like, okay, what am I, you know? And I asked my mom, I was like, hey mom, what, are, what am I? She was like, oh, pues, you know, you're you a citizen. I was like, all right. I was like, oh, tú eres Latina, like not Hispanic, so you fill that in. And then I was like, race part. And I was like, you know, it has African American, white, um, Native American, Pacific Islander. And she's like, oh, pues, pon you know, Native American. And my parents were always in survival, were always working, I was like, okay. And I never knew what that meant, you know, to put that as a bubble, um, because they never explained it to me. You know, and I just continued throughout high school, just kind of like always feeling this ambiguity with who I was, learn, knowing Spanish, but then, you know, it was like a division, like in high school, I had to find a way to assimilate. And I went to the point where you know, there's so much shadism in our culture that we don't want to be darker. You know, so it's like having, being authentic because I had to be with my parents and speak Spanish to them, but also going into the education system and having to also navigate those spaces. And it wasn't until I got to college that I was always feeling weird until I took Ethnic Studies 101 and I was like the last one to sign up for it. And I remember like walking in and it was just such a diverse classroom because in my high school, it was only a few of us that were Latino back in the day. You know, now there's more of us, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> but, and I remember just like learning about like all these microaggressions, institutionalized racism and how I was always so hard on myself. And I was like, whoa, I was like, I wasn't the problem. You know, I forgave myself. I was like, it, it wasn't me. And, you know, college really empowered me to, then I decided to study abroad in Mexico and that's what brought me. I was like, where do I come from? Like, who am I? You know, and that's why I went to Mexico. Like, everyone's like, why are you going to Mexico? You're Mexican. And I'm like, yeah, but we, don't, we never get to learn about ourselves. We never get to learn our story of where we come from. You know, that's something that was missing, that even though we, I knew the language and my parents, we practiced some of the culture, you know, they didn't have time to really explain to me all of the parts of me. And when I went to Mexico and I finally got to learn about like my ancestors and like our resistance and just like where we come from, it like really empowered me and it made me realize like, wow, like we come from warriors, you know? And, um, the work that I do now, I work in Southern Oregon with the story project on collecting stories of who we are, you know, to 
tell our stories, to create a platform. And also I work with youth and I do a lot of workshops around different you know, identity and culture because we shouldn't wait for them to, un to learn about themselves because the school's not teaching them. We should be teaching them now. So this is some of the work that I've done. And for me, you know, after leaving that museum and being in Mexico, like it was just kind of really eye opener and I reclaimed my identity, I reclaimed my language and I reclaim who I am. Thank you. Next, we have Lourdes Sanchez. Lourdes is an attorney whose firm specializes in protecting the rights of injured people for nearly two decades now. Lourdes joins us from Eugene tonight. Welcome Lourdes uh, to the stage. Buenas noches. So this is something that Nelson Mandela said, which resonates with me and my story. He said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And that's really my story. My parents are from the Dominican Republic. Um, when I was four years old, my father died. So picture this, a four-year-old girl, father dies. My mom was 27 years old at the time, raising two children by herself with no financial support. You know, there's no welfare in our countries. There's no other support. And her family at the time lived in Puerto Rico. So we ended up having to migrate to Puerto Rico where we lived in a household with 15 relatives. My mom promptly realized this is not what I want for my children in the future. So she started working weekend jobs cleaning houses and she would take us along with her to, to help her as much as we could so she could save money. And I remember my family thought she was crazy because one day she said, my kids are gonna speak English and we are gonna move to the United States. We are going to live in a place called Eugene, Oregon. And they just thought, what the heck? She's lost it, you know? <laughs> Might as well have told, have said Siberia. They just thought that was like the end of the world. In my family, we all pretty much lived within a few, a few blocks of each other. So for her to say she was leaving the country to the west coast of the United States was like basically, we would probably not see them again for a long time, and, and that's what happened. So we came here when I was 12, and, oh, 12, okay. And I was a freshman in high school. Um, my mom, with that job that she had cleaning houses, she saved up to buy three one-way airline tickets, okay? Which meant there was no backup plan. This had to work. Okay, so we landed here in Oregon with no family. We didn't speak English. We had no money. We had no car. We had no bike. We really didn't have much in terms of resources. Okay, all that we had was my mom's idea that this was going to work. All we had to do was study hard and work hard. What we didn't realize was when I entered high school, there was no ESL program. They had never figured out that somebody could come and move here at the high school level. So they had ESL for elementary school children and middle school children, but nothing for high school. So what was their bright idea? They wanted me to go back to the sixth grade from ninth grade to sixth grade. And I said, are you kidding me? I don't think so. So their other solution was, well, you're on your own. It's sink or swim, basically. And I said, well, you know, we haven't had it easy in our lives. Um, I'll take my chances. My best friend who was from Mexico, we were the only two students 
at the time in the entire school who didn't speak English. This was her third try as a freshman to try to graduate and make it in high school. She gave up after the first trimester. And I always remember that because she dropped out of high school. She became a statistic, but nobody really figured out that really the system failed us. Because later on I learned that by law, even though there was no ESL classroom, we were supposed to have been provided with tutors. Of course, I wouldn't learn that until later on. So I studied hard. Somehow, because you're a kid, you learn English. So I absorbed it from music, from TV, from trying to fit in. You know, at the beginning, everything was just blah, 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 blah. But somehow, slowly, it started making sense. And I graduated with honors from high school. Yeah, yeah. The interesting thing about that is, despite that, not one counselor in my school told me, hey, you need to apply for scholarships. Hey, are you going to college? What are your plans? Not one, not one. I think they thought that was as far as I was gonna go. There wasn't really much expectation of me at the time. I mean, you gotta think, female, minority, didn't speak English, you know, in poverty, because we really had no assets. Um, I don't think they really expected much from me. But luckily, because of my mom, and really the, Latin, the small Latino community at the time, who did expect a lot out of me, they figured out a scholarship opportunity for me. So I got a full ride to the University of Oregon. Okay? Yeah. So, I was 16, sorry, I gotta brag about that. So I was 16 and a freshman in college, but shortly after that, I got pregnant because I had my boyfriend and I thought I was grown and I was out of high school, which most of my family members who were women, that's as far as they got high school and then they got married and had children. So that's kind of the route I was thinking I was gonna go except my mom wouldn't let me go that route <laughs> at the time. So anyway, I was pregnant. Okay, one more thing I had to basically overcome. So I went to school right until the day before I gave birth. I was a freshman in college. I continued on with my studies. And when I was a senior in college wondering about, well, what am I gonna do after this? Because I was a math major. I walked into an event much like this, and it was about encouraging minorities to go to grad school. And you're thinking, oh great, right? You're finishing school, like, you know, bachelor's, your undergrad, and they're thinking about more schooling. But what I heard that day changed things for me, because it was a presentation on how to be a lawyer. Now, I don't know about you, but I had never met a lawyer in my life. I didn't know what they did. I didn't know how you went about finding one. I didn't know where they shop, where they lived, <laughs> nothing about them. But I remember the professor, it was Stephen Bender, he said, we need more minority representation, more bilingual attorneys. We need us to help our communities. And that resonated with me, because I remember that little girl in high school who dropped out because the school didn't provide what she needed to stay in school, okay? And I learned that if you don't know your rights, nobody's gonna tell them to you, okay? So I remember thinking, well, if you don't know the law, who tells you? Nobody tells you, you gotta go and find out. So to me, that was something that spoke to me. So after the presentation, I, I went to him and I said, could I become a lawyer? I have good grades. That's all I knew. I didn't know what else was needed. But he told me, he told me and he said, we need more students like you to become members of the Oregon State Bar. 
So he guided me. He became my mentor. And he guided me through the process. And sure enough, three years later, I was an attorney. And I eventually, yep, eventually opened up my practice. I represent injured people. Most of my clients do not speak English. Many are afraid to assert their rights. Okay, so bottom line is, I became an attorney. My son became an attorney. So the little boy in that picture is an attorney as well. So through education, I was able to remove some of the financial barriers for him, and we both contribute to the community. So we sponsor soccer tournaments because we know everybody likes to come together as a community and you know uh, watch the games cultural events, I want kids, I want people to feel part of the community. I want people to feel proud of who they are. And that's it, si se puede. Well, we're coming to the last one. It's the last but not the least. Someone that I've enjoyed talking with in her other, other half whenever I visit Central Oregon, and that is Julia Fleet. <laughs> Julia has a background in elementary and early childhood education and works as a preschool readiness specialist for the migrant education program in the Central Oregon region. So she's come all the way from Ben to share her story with us. Julia. Buenas noches a todos. Mi nombre es Julia Elena Fleet. Y yo, uh, I have to go to English. I was born and raised in La Paz, Bolivia. I went to a German school, and my favorite subjects were math, chemistry, physics, and biology. I wanted to be a chemical engineer. And my plan was to pursue my higher education in Germany. But plans changed, because I was invited by an aunt of mine to come to the United States, specifically to Northern California to study. I accepted the invitation only because it was California, and I was hoping to have the opportunity to go to Disneyland, which I did eight months after I arrived. Well, when I came to Los Angeles Airport, I came on September 7, 1960. Seven. You can do the math. And I came with a student visa. I spoke Spanish, German, and a little bit of British English, which didn't help me at all. When they asked me at the immigration counter to take my sunglasses off and to surrender my x-rays, because you know, on those days, Anybody that would come to the United States had to bring their lung x-rays with them. Well, plan B was, okay, I will stay. I will get a two-year degree in data processing, go back to La Paz, apply what I studied, and still pursue my chemical engineer dream. How about that? Well. Something happened to me when I went to register to the ANSA College in California. I went, I felt my papers, I gave them to the uh, clerk, and she crossed the little spot where I put that I was white. Because until then, I was a white female. And she said, you are brown. And I said, why? And she said, because you are South American, you are Latina, and you are brown. 
At that moment, I didn't realize that that was a racist remark that had lots of implications for later on. When I went to uh, college, I had to take ESL on those days, that was the name. And there were some students at the college that made fun of me because I spoke funny. Well, those were two incidents that planted a seed in me. Eventually, three days later, I met a wonderful man. And six months later, I married John Fleet. He was, he is, he is from Chile. And you know what? His grandfather was British, my grandmother German. Enemies, historically, <laughs> right? He is from Chile, I'm from Bolivia, the Pacific War, oops, enemies, right? But you know what, for us it was so what? We are who we are and we'll go from here. When, uh, when we got married, he had a tourist visa and I had my um, student visa that very soon expired. And when we had our first son, we were able to fill out the papers to get a permanent visa. So we did. But we lived for several years in fear because they were raids, immigration raids, and we didn't have the papers, and we were working, and we had a son. But eventually, three years after, we went to Bolivia to get our resident papers. Five years after, which that was the green card, after uh, five years, I became a United States citizen. Well, <laughs> I have my chick note because remember a long time ago, memory, uh, okay. Well, as you probably remember, I never wanted to be an educator. I wanted to be a chemical engineer. But you know what happened? While I was working in the private sector, the seed that was planted in me when I was going through college and through many things, only needed a Johnny, Ellie, and Christy, our children. They are the ones that inspire me to go back to study, to get my bilingual teaching credential, and to start working for the community, for my community. Because I met many, many families whose children were not thriving in school because of the, you know, the language barriers that they had. And so, I thought, well, my kids, we spoke Spanish at home. My English was not so cool, but they were doing fine. What was the difference? Well, it was our involvement, our involvement in their school. So we were there for them. So I went back and I got my teaching credential. It was kind of crazy because in two years I got what everybody gets in five years. But I didn't have enough time, you know. It was too late. I wanted to get involved. And so I had the, the support of my family in order to do it. So I graduated from San Jose State University and there I went. I taught first grade for many years. But the first year that I started teaching in the San Jose um, School District, I proposed to my principal to have one strand of classes from kindergarten to fifth, where we would teach everything in Spanish and we would teach English as a second language. We started that year from kindergarten to third year, uh, grade. The following year, we added fourth and fifth. And 
also we started a group, a parent-teacher association in Spanish, where we had interpreters for the English speakers. The principal didn't speak any Spanish, but she helped me and the other teachers. So we did it, and that was the beginning of the success of those students, because when they finished fifth grade, they were fully bilingual, they were at grade level, and even further. So many of those students are now doctors, engineers, bilingual. So we can do it. When I came to Oregon, that's when I felt discrimination. Not only because of the race, not only because of, uh, um, you know, but the color of my skin. I don't look Latina, they tell me. I don't speak like Hispanic person. And maybe it's the German that I had to learn in school. But I lived discrimination, especially in Oregon. And I have to say, I went 20 years back to where I was when I was in California, especially in the inclusion and equity in education. And that's the reason I'm here. And I have to cut, because otherwise I will take over the night. <laughs> but I want to tell you that I am Julia Elena Fleet. I am very proud of the country I come from, and I keep my traditions from, and I am very proud of the country where I live, and I started my family, and I'm here to stay. Thank you. So I'm, I'm supposed to sum all of these seven stories up. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. But here, this is what I think. I think that in each of these stories, there's a little bit of those stories in each of us. I truly believe that. A little bit of that. The concern for our lives, for our families, for work, losing someone to violence, or wanting to create change and have the power to create that change. And while doing it, shaking up the norms and the expectations that have been put upon us. Or learning the tools, the language, getting an education to be able to create changes and, and help and protect others. Or ensuring that young children are not left behind in education because we have an experience in education. So I believe that it is through these stories that we share with one another that we show our humanity. That, that we share and that we show that we're made of bones and flesh, that we have a blood running through our veins that ties us all, no matter what our skin is. The person that's sitting next to you has the same blood running through their veins as you have. Stories and the storytelling gives us the context where we are. This is where we are now. 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, we were somewhere else. But this is where we are now. So this is the context in which we live. And, and this is the context in which we might, we must look for ways in creating changes. Because I think we heard this morning, we have the power, we have the potential, we should seek for the opportunity to create those changes. That is my interpretation of the stories. And so with that, I really am in gratitude to the storytellers. But before I go there, I want to thank, really, the, the, the people and the friends and the partners that have made this possible. From, and I want to get, uh, where, is, where is she? 
Emily Prado. Why don't you come up and then. <laughs> Emily helped work with us in helping coordinate, find the storytellers, work with them, get them to, to, to craft their story and put them in contact with Elena Lim, who is also the, the coach, the storytelling coach. And then having this great night in the production with Mauricio and Valadrian and the consulting and Eric, his, his support staff. And most definitely also uh, Brisa, Fabi, Papi, and Savila in playing with us here. And they're gonna stay with us and play more, so don't go away. And also, where is Benny? from our sound tech. Thank you very much for, for all that, for all that. Because this sounds really great, if, but it's because he's doing a magic pack there. <laughs> and then really, the storytellers. So if I may ask each of the storytellers to stand up and recognize their story, because in their story, there is something of us. So, Eddie, Erika, Eduardo, Jaime, Lourdes, Saira, and Julia, Elena Fleet. Thank you very much for sharing your story.